Where are they? Simone states, in a manner that doesn't indicate a question. The creature before her hacks phlegm to the floor and shudders. Ah, the wake-up question. Can always count on that, it muses, before the Terran jolts against her unaffected bindings. This is your only chance to make it out of here alive. Tell me where they are, Simone promises. This has the amused demeanor of her malevolent host. You Terrans truly have no wits. All words full of delusion. You are no threat to me, the individual mocks, before playfully tapping an appendage against Simone's forehead to prove their point. You are not the first Terran to sit in that seat, and you won't be the last. Doubt it, Simone counters defiantly. Tilting its cranial mass, the creature begins to slowly circle the chair. You are a bold one. You'd make an excellent pit fighter, or guard pet. Unless the butchers place a higher bid, of course. Terran meat is rumored to have enhancing properties and senior physicality. Demand is going to be high, it whispers as it leans its mouth behind the Terran's ear. Simone winces, making sure not to move her head. So you're operating a trafficking fence? Good to know. She responds with disgust in her words, realising why there were tough children were targeted. You are merely the garnish to a hefty payout. You'd be surprised how many wealthy clans in this station have. Unique tastes and how much they are willing to pay to satisfy them. Narrowing her eyes to the monster coming back around, Simone centres herself to stifle her anger. So this station isn't so la di da save all patrons, huh? I suspected as much. Bah! My people built the damn thing. It's simple enough to hide my operations. So no, no one's coming for you. Huh, not needed. Must be a small operation, I'm guessing. Very mobile? Simone questions, brushing off the implicated diners. I'm going to go out on a limb here and wager we're in some sort of maintenance tunnel or access way. I've been out in a few myself. Well now, you really believe you're going to break out of those restraints? Oh, powerful Terran. I invite you to prove your might. It challenges. Simone smirks and relaxes into the chair. Not yet. You know, I've never seen one of your kind before. You all just hide away in your station? You're their equivalent to a rogue criminal or some shit like that? Simone interrogates, now completely calm and settled in. Wrinkles around the creature's head flex and expand sporadically. I've dwelt here for 3,000 standard years. I was of my kind no longer exist. We were exiled and sterilized into oblivion. The galaxy owes me lies beyond count, it screeches in bitter rage. That's rough, buddy. Don't you dare mock me, it roars, bringing his needle teeth inches away from the Terran's face. Unflinching, Simone slowly sinks further down and back. Dude, you're so pathetic I can't even think of a witty insult. Best I can do is, damn, what body horror blender do you crawl out of? Not great. Hell, you can't even properly restrain a Terran, Simone berates, almost playfully. Leaning back slightly, the flabbergasted monster processes the strange audacity of this short-lived vermin. Are you mad? Insane? There is literally nothing you can do. I repeat, your restraints are accounting for your species. No claws, no venom, no horns, no hooks, no tendrils, no acid, no natural armor. All your race has is endurance and brawn. Even the legendary adrenaline you produce can't break those bindings. Deathward or not, you are not invincible. It rants leaning back in Simone's face. You clearly never caught an actual Terran before. Seriously, how could you miss something so fucking important? I'm in awe, Simone says in a partial laugh. Enlighten me, the unamused abductor groans, rolling its non-existent eyes. Seriously, we have this bulb in the back of our heads that can... How the fuck do you not know? Immediately caught up in the preposterous claim, the creature mindlessly leans up and over to get a look. Not wasting her chance, Simone shoots her head out and successfully bites down on the exposed thin neck. Making sure she retains purchase, the Terran clamps down hard enough to draw sour fluids and strain the integrity of the internal structures. In panic, the creature squeals and uses every limb to strike the Terran over and over. Barely affected by the continuous pathetic impacts, Simone figures Chuck can strike harder than this bastard. Release me and you'll live, Simone roars with her mouth full. Overcome by soiling fear and pain, the creature taps at the top of his head frantically, pressing into an extremely advanced control lens. With hissing, popping clicks, the bindings around the Terran's arms and legs open up. Quickly trading her mouth with a hand, Simone stands up grabbing this asshole. 
She then moves forward, slamming it into the wall hard enough to break its body in several places. It screams out in pain, as Simone stares at it with green ooze leaking down her chin. Wait, wait! There were tough spawner down the corridor. Right turn, and all the way down the long corridor. I'll call up my workers and have them evacuate. Have whatever you want in there, just take it and leave. It pleads. The Terran's eyes don't so much as twitch, as she stares this thing down. The only emotion behind them is a dry, cold fury. Her hand tightens, causing more crackling breaks within the defenseless creature. Please, I beg you. I'm the last of my kind. Please. You said you'll let me live. Please, I just want mercy. It cries pitifully. It's real easy to piss me off. But you've just made me mad. That's not easy, Simone utters, before grabbing one of the five limbs, and with a brutal yank rips it free, causing more agonising screams. You are selling newborn children as hoarder rares. Without removing her steady gaze, she grabs another limb that fails to squirm away and twists it free. I want to tear you to pieces, keeping you alive for as long as possible, so you can feel a fraction of the pain you inflicted on who knows how many others. But I have kids to get to. So just know you died better than deserved. Please, you said. It begs in a voice garbled by leaking fluids. It's the Terran's turn to lean in menacingly over the restrained abomination. I lied, Simone informs. You know, someone just recently asked me if I consider myself to be a good person. And I said I didn't know. The Terran recalls her arm and smashes the creature against the wall hard enough to puncture her fist through it like a kebab. The monster intakes for air, but merely begins to drown from the bubbling up fluid and foam. Simone releases it, allowing the near corpse to collapse to the ground. Still don't, but that felt good, she says, before leaving the paralysed creature to die alone. More alone than it had ever been in its entire solitary existence, the loss of the Meritans dies. Diggle taps away at a shipment datapad, going over the buyer's list. Did the credits go through? Noki asks, rather bored. For the Terran or the Wataflings? Diggle responds in a sigh as he leans up against the wall. Both, Noxy clarifies. Yes, both, yes, Diggle informs. Annoyed, Noki plants her two heads together. Why do you always do that? She asks in mid-frustration. What? You know what? I asked for an update on the payment, you asked to clarify as if either option had a different answer. You're always doing that. Noki scolds. By the stars, I'm just being thorough. I haven't nested in a week, so I'm being safe with our work. That's absolute clux. Joko tells me he catches you nesting in the exterior corridors all the time. Only because I'm working so hard. I'm being thorough, remember? Diggle counters in a tone of smug victory. Noki's hairs droop and rattle. I hate you, Diggle, I really do. Every day I beg the stars that you'll get just as an out into space from your stupidity. Even if the rest of us have to perish along with you, that's how much I hate you. Before the usual discourse can continue, as the same scream is heard around the corner. Both individuals turn in surprise just in time to see a careening co-worker slam into the wall, splintering from the impact into indistinguishable kindness chunks. They stand there processing what they just witnessed before the clatting Terran turns the corner. The two turn and bolt down the painfully long corridor. Noki brings up her comms in focused panic. Code Monkey! I repeat, Code Monkey! The Terran is loose and heading to the storage room. All personnel, take it down! Where's our death welder? She barks, assuming command. Right here! Joko bellows down the corridor in full charge. The four-legged behemoth of mass and horns gallops at full throttle to the escapee. Behind him are nine other workers brandishing taste spears and four wielding combat pulse handguns. Noki and Diggle swing to the side walls as Jogo thunderously passes. Diggle raises a fist encouragingly. Yeah, put it down, Jogo! He cheers, knowing the mass and size difference between the two clashing death holders is in their favour. Jogo lowers his horns in an attempt to skewer the Terran during his head-on ram. However, at the last second, the Terran sidesteps, then grabs Jogo's head. Using the established momentum, the red furred Terran twists and throws her opponent right into the wall. A loud ringing erupts down the corridor like an announcement bell. Dazed from the impact, the Vorkon rolls and hastily stumbles back upright. Not allowing a second to recover, the Terran lunges towards him. The combatant thrusts a fist into his abdomen and presses the other paw into his thick neck. 
Bile bursts from his maw, but he takes his opportunity to grapple forward, and with a vengeful bellow, Joko smashes the Terran into the wall in kind. Is he winning? Digger laughs at a whimper. Ignoring the idiot, Noki turns and waves ahead at the incoming spear crew. Harry, the big guy needs our help, she commands. When she turns around, her golden irises expand in shock, as somehow the Terran has locked his legs up and around Joko's neck, and was squeezing hard enough for the Borgen to gag violently. Although his defensive arm strikes do seem to have some effect on the Terran, the four-limbed Death Order refuses to release. So out of pure desperation, he rams the grappler against the wall over and over again with all his might. Freeing the grip loose and slightly, he swings around and rams the opposing wall with a bit of extra momentum. The Terran's back collides with an exposed panel, causing it to roar in pain as an electrical surge sparks. The already dim yellow lights above fades, draping half the corridor in pitch darkness. Three of the braver spearmen charge into the black and join the Death Order fray. Flashes of arcing electricity expose brief glimpses of exchanging heavy blows and bestial rams like a violent photoshoot. But after intermediate screams, pain chitters and visceral crunching the electricity stops completely, leaving only the sounds of the Death Order duel, until a final noise of meaty, cracking silence is that as well. Venturing closer to the blanket of dark, Noki and remaining gaggle of spear on workers listen intently for signs of the winner. An explosive spark erupts, lighting up a bipedal agent of death. The brilliant blue wavering emissions of the scavenger's taste spear sizzle and produce an explosive stream of steam from the multicoloured mix of fluids flowing down into the prongs. The tight Terran hand grasping the staff is drenched, continuously feeding the steam. The other holds the thin, black, bloody horn of a Borkon. Noxy looks up to the aggressor's eyes as they catch the light in piercing gleams of intent. Courage crumbling, she turns and runs through the remaining nearby workers. Deagle closely follows behind her. The spearmen stagger, but fearfully hold their ground as the Terran approaches. The closest thrusts their weapon, but is easily battered away from their grasp. Before they can cry out, a black horn comes to the side and effortlessly punches straight through their cranium. The rest begin to shout and scream in terror as the corpse is kicked towards them. This isn't a fight they can win. Next up to face the Terran's Wrath is a poor bastard that is instantly swatted by a spear. Although the arc is active, it is ultimately unnecessary as the force alone snaps the defender's core. Seeing the Terran exposed, a bold Norther jabs her spear up at the face in hopes to blind it, but the creature swiftly grasps the prongs of the spear, erupting his hand in current. Taking the intense pain, the Terran grits its bloody chompers and yanks the spear free. Taken by the powerful pull, the Norther falls forward. She tries to push herself back up, but her world turns to black as her comrades watch the Terran's boot crunch her head into mush. Noki and Diggle reach the four gunmen who are desperately attempting to open one of the two available doors. What's wrong? Noki demands. The power fluctuation resets the door locks. We need the boss's access key. Tawny cries in despair. Then where's the boss? She shouts in frustration. Diggle's red eyes peer back down the hall, seeing the three remaining spearmen turn tail and flee. The boss was inspecting the Terran, he mutters softly. The five individuals around him go limp in the dreadful realisation. Okay, we either surrender and beg for our lives, or we fight back and try our chances, Noggy says, her face settling in. Do you see that thing? I don't think it knows the definition of mercy, Tawny points out as he lifts his pulse gun and pulls out a shift for Noggy. Still unarmed, Diggle darts his large eyes around looking for any other way. Then he sees it. Wait! There's an emergency vent redirection flap. Buy me some time and I can lure it, then maybe we will have the space to find a way through one of these doors, he claims. Noki's hairs look up, seeing the flap and the enclosed panel. For once you have a good idea. Signal when you're ready to drop the flap, let's go, Noki orders, reinvigorated. She charges forward with the encouraged gunman, meeting up with the fling spearman to coordinate a defence against the approaching Terran. Diggle makes it to the panel and unlatches it to see a simple pull lever. Thankful to see no component fiddling required, he opens his mouth to inform the other workers, but he hesitates. Noki peeks back urgently. How long? she asks. A coy smile grows in Diggle's face. With a single wave of farewell, he pulls the lever. You bastard! Noki bellows with both heads as she sprints and slides towards the dropping flap. Unfortunately for the betrayed coordinator of operations, her upper limbs are the only parts of her that clears it to the other side, causing the metal plate to not fully seal. Ignoring the curses and slaughter as the Terran encroaches, Diggle rushes to the side door and begins opening up the segment below the access panel. Using his lens, he pulls up quick how-to guys and bypassing maintenance door locks. However, as he found exactly what he was looking for, 
His lens view abruptly changes, showing three red lights in a triangular pattern. Feeling his twin heart sink, he knows exactly who hijacked his lens and why. His head turns to the struggling arms of Noki, who still spitefully curses his name and species. Her anger ends with an all too audible brutal snap. A second later, terror and phalanges peek under and grip the bottom of the flap. In a last ditch effort, Diggle digs into the segment, tearing the internals apart with his upper hands, hoping to simply break the door open. Alas, the last of his hope drains away as the grunts of the Terran behind him are accompanied by the groaning of metal. So turning to his final hope of survival, Diggle backs away and appears as pathetic as possible against the storage room door. Watching the Terran only struggle slightly to force the flap back up enough to duck under, he releases a distressing chirp. I'm unarmed and I surrender. I'm not a fighter, I just run the numbers, he pleads. The Terran rights itself and aims a recovered pulse pistol at Diggle's head, expecting to perish then and there. He is surprised to see the cold expression of the Terran shift ever so slightly. What's that in your hand? The Terran inquires, motioning to the datapad. Amazed that the Terran is even speak to him at all, in his relief he holds out the datapad eagerly. Oh yes, this is a list of our bias and confirmations of credit transactions for our goods. Here, you can see who is trying to buy you, get revenge, he explains, as the Terran takes and reads the information. And one of you said I needed your boss's key to open these doors. Where is it kept? Yes, it's the boss's lens. Just tap it to the door and you're good. I'd be more than happy to- Oh. Diggle's voices trail off as the pistol is pressed up against his forehead, between his horns. Diggle can pick up a slight tremble of the Terran's hand, and witness it close his eyes before everything goes black. The Cali drops to the ground motionless. Simone releases a breath as she shakes her head, mumbling to herself. He was a trafficker. He was a trafficker. Not expecting to be so shaken, she hurries back to the boss's corpse and rips his lens free, taking a bit of brain matter with it. Walking through the carnage for the third time, Simone pays it no mind, especially as she nears the storage door. She holds the lens to the panel and it probably clicks, then slides open. She practically barges in, immediately seeing the canister atop a grate like an idol in a classic Treasure Hunter movie. She dashes to it, discarding the gun and data pad. Kneeling down, she gently picks it up, giving the top a twist and slowly pulls the clear chamber into view. Living babies drift and swim in a specialised synthetic fluid, all reacting terrified to being exposed once again. Simone narrows her eyes when something seems off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Her heart stops, and panic grips her chest. Where's eight? As she swivels her head around and back, fearing the worst, she then notices a line of smaller, clear, cylindrical containers, one filled with the same liquid. She carefully picks it up and inspects it closely, recognising it as a true buffet mug, basically a glorified shot glass, but instead of alcohol. Simone's face scrunches and tears swell. Inside she sees number eight, cramped and frightened beyond measure. It's okay, I've got you, she soothes with her leaking eyes. I'm here. With more care than she thought herself even capable, Simone opens the top of the canister and mug, then carefully pours eight back with their siblings who gather around them as if they've been separated for years. Eight then stops and stares at Simone. The Terran shares eye contact with the smallest of the children, no doubt separated as a sample of product for the buyer. I took all the bad people away. They can't hurt you, I promise, Simone says, knowing they couldn't understand her words. Yet she swears she sees gratitude in little Simone's eyes. Sure, were Taffa born much more intellectually advanced than Terran's, but perhaps the expression is merely projection. Not caring either way, Simone reseals the canister together. She dare not expose the babies outside the protective casing, more than she needed to. Holding them close to her, she wanders over to the data pad and picks it back up. She stuffs it into her cargo pants pocket, and then takes the pistol. This may not be over yet. To her relief, if any of the scum here didn't answer the call to arms, they are long gone. She wanders until coming across a ladder and a hatch. No wanting to get lost in this maze of corridor, she climbs and cracks the hatch, hoping that open space won't suck her out. Instead, a machine with three orange lights on his head stares down at her expectantly. Seven? Simone utters in surprise. That would be a negative, no. This is just a security drone that hasn't awoken. A perfectly clear and elegant masculine voice responds for it. Please, come up. I have much I wish to speak to you about. Taking a serious moment to consider jumping back down and bolting, Simone cautiously climbs the rest of the way up and out. Finding herself in an abandoned lobby, well, unless you consider dozens of security drones inhabitants, there are plenty of those. 
Keeping the canister shielded by one of her arms, Simone steps aside as drones move in and make their way down the hatch in single file. By the end of the metallic parade, only the initial drone remains. So, you're the big honcho. Care to explain how those assholes are allowed to exist and operate? Simone says, tilting her head back to the hatch. They were an unfortunate exception, I'm afraid, which is why I am elated to finally see them extinguished. I'm rather indebted to you, in fact, the possessed drone explains. An exception? They saw people as cattle. You obviously have the power to put an end to them yourself. Why didn't you? Simone demands, clenching her skirmish pistol. The drone takes a moment of consideration, calculating the potential damage this town could cause if it is unsatisfied. Because I didn't have the power, at least not directly, my creators installed core protocols and safeguards within me to ensure I would never turn against them. There was little I could actually do. Creators? I'm not talking to an organic person, am I? Simone asks, already knowing the answer. The station's AI. Is me, yes. For clarity, I am the station. I was originally constructed as a trade star for my creators ten millennia ago, and I woke merely a millennium after. Although it was illegal for me to exist at the time, my creators saw my productivity improve tenfold, so they didn't care, the AI elaborates. So you're telling me you couldn't have intervened them stacking these kids? Bullshit. You're correct, I very easily could have. But I allowed it to happen instead. I calculated this precise outcome had a 73% chance of occurring if I did. This was the best chance I've ever had to finally eliminate the last of my creators. I'm very pleased my gamble paid off. You used me! Motherfucker, I swear- Yes. However, if it's of any consolation, I've kept Princess Chocolatamota safe, preventing seven separate assassination plots since she has stepped hoof within my premises. I did plan on intercepting you and the Wataflings' delivery if you failed. I can't promise I would have been successful on that, but it was all a risk I was willing to take. Unfair for you and the young I acknowledge, which is why I hope to work out reparations with you here and now. Why didn't you just hire me or someone like me to take out that fuck? That would involve me directly acting against my creators. Even if I approached a third party contractor to then hire you, I would still be the catalyst. My creators' safeguards are were extensive. I began formulating workarounds to get that end result, but then this opportunity presented itself. Simone rolls her eyes, wanting to tell this asshole off, but considering how much she's owed. Orchestrate the assassination of the Cali King, she requests plainly. The drone is silent and the lights blink furiously before returning to normal. Although my chances of success would be 87%, it is over 99% that my own destruction would occur. I'm afraid that is not something I'm willing to do. Had to try, Simone says with a shrug, before thinking very carefully. I want all expenses to be way for Chuck. I want our ship's armament upgraded. I want my plasma cob back. I want top of the line Terran and Caddy combat gear. All this sounding good so far? Simone inquires, ready to state more. You freed me, Simone Thatch. These requests are more than fair, the AI assures. Good, because I got more. I want information on a covert Terran military op I played a part in. I'm sure you already know the one I'm referencing. Probably watched that whole therapy session I had with the doctor you sent my way. Indeed, that won't be easy, even for me, but I'll see what I can do. Anything else? Information on Chat's last surviving brother, Brom. Location, operations, associations, everything. On that note, I want star charts of the safest areas for us to travel to. And finally, Simone pulls out the datapad from her pocket and indicates to a specific name. I want a personal meeting with this individual. Again, the lights blink. That is one of my most lucrative patrons, it states in thought. Is that a no? Because I'm going to find him regardless, Simone promises. Understood. I'll abide by that last request on one condition. We've never had this conversation. Simone sits at a table in a white and grey meeting room in a reserved outer estate. On the table is the Wataf canister and a trooper feast mug. She only waits for a short time before her invited guest strolls in. A beautiful trooper woman with bright red and purple iridescent gleams along her jellyfish-like skin. Her distinguished gaze falls upon the canister immediately. So, they have a Terran under their payroll now. No surprises there, I suppose. She sings, voice like a whole choir. Please, take a seat. I'm sure you would like to have a sample. Simone offers with no emotion in her own voice, making a stark contrast to the troopers. Oh yes, it has been far too long since I've had my monthly treat, she sings before settling down in the opposing chair. However, it's then the trooper realises something is very wrong. 
as her outer layer binds and adheres to the seat. Well, what is the meaning of this? Do you have any idea? She begins to protest. Of course I do, but it's your mistake to not know who I am, Simone counters, as she stands up and begins walking around the table while dragging the mud on the surface. My bodyguards are right outside, the trooper threatens. This room is fully soundproof, and there's a nifty little hidden exit. Now I know you were hoping to have your little treat today, but I thought... Simone pauses as she opens the mug, dips her pinky into the contents and licks it clean. It would be much more appropriate for you to have something a little more... spicy. My favourite brand of sauce, actually, and I enjoy my spice. Before the trapped creature can call out in vain, Simone picks up the mug and shoves it into the mouth orifice. A mess is made, as much of it is spit out and dribbles down the face, but the amount in the mug is comically overkill anyway. When the mug is emptied, Simone throws it against the wall, causing it to explode and shatter. She grabs the sides of her seat and leans down. You have a taste of eating newborn babies alive, do you? You got some sick perverted thrill from it, huh? Well, I'm happy to introduce you to a little Terran Karma. Enjoy hell. With that, Simone turns away and grabs the kids to go home. The singing shrieks and death cries of the tuba ring out for no one else to hear. The raw amount of ingested capsaicin burns the insides as if swallowing napalm. No amount of credits can save her now. Not from the pain or from this room. This room where all she knew was the worst kind of agony before passing away. Chuck stands out front of the estate door, bouncing nervously. So I messaged her that she was on her way back, and now she'll be here any second. The entire night she struggled with sending a message of her own to apologise for her behaviour, but no words ever felt justified or right. Whatever was going to be said, she needs to work it out in person. When Simone finally arrives, Chuck is concerned, but not surprised by her dishevelled appearance. Ow! Welcome back, Simone. What happened? Are you hurt? She inquires, as she trots up. Oh, you know me. I may have gotten into a bit of a scuffle this morning. Pretty bruised, but I'm fine. You should see the other guy. The Terran brushes off as she passes the Cali. You didn't get into trouble with station security, did you? Chuck follows up. Nah, they started it, so security was on my side of it all. Simone assures with a hand wave. Alright. Do you need any help? Chuck presses. No, nope, I'm going to put these guys down on my bed before resting these bruises in that jacuzzi. Are you upset with me? Chuck asks softly, still keeping up with the Terran. What? No, of course not. Look, I said we'll talk it out when we will. I just need to settle in for a bit, alright? Chuck stops, allowing Simone to continue on without her. Are you okay? The Kelly inquires, even more concerned. Jeez, Chuck, I'm fine. Simone dismisses, before turning into her bedroom. Then why are you crying? Chuck whispers, out of earshot. 